get started. Welcome everyone to the Chaos OSPO Metrics Working Group Meeting for October 17th. We are already having a lively discussion about the first thing that you ate today. So that is that is the, the question of the day. We've got some, some good stuff there. Uh, cookies, that sounds like a... Um, Interesting choice. A good choice, but a delicious one. Um, <laughs> Tim's being all healthy with the banana. That's good. Every and chocolate yogurt. Yeah. And Yari with the yogurt. Yeah, yogurt's a popular choice. Okay. Yeah, Elizabeth, I agree. Like that's that's the best thing about being an adult is I can I can just do whatever I want. <laughs> and not having any kids, like I'm not even not even a bad influence on anybody. <laughs> If I want to eat cookies for breakfast, I can. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, Matt, I know you said you're kind of in, in listening mode, but I think the, the second item on the agenda is yours. And if you don't mind, maybe we should just talk about that one first, if you're okay with that. What is the... The metrics, metric model, models, model graph. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Maybe this is something else. Uh, all right. Let me just let me back up. Who added metrics and metrics models graph contribution proposal to the agenda? Oh, I Damien. Did. Okay. But Sorry. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> I looked at that and I thought it was I thought it was something else. Something that Matt's been talking about. Um, no, it's, it's about some conversation that is going on there. So there is a big conversation about what metrics are being used by models and stuff like that. And are they more important, not important? And I was trying to look for the website and there is in each model, the list of metrics that are used, but there is no uh, global visualization of this thing. So I was wanting to just write the script to scrap all that stuff and make a graph. So we know what is connected with what. But before I started working, I wanted to check that nobody did it before. Um, oh, that's is, a really that's a really interesting question. Is there something like that we have in the website and I just didn't found it or? Could you just yeah, I... a bit more? I'm not sure I totally follow. I mean, I, I like the idea and premise, but I'd like to hear a little bit more. <laughs> So we have all these website pages. We have the metrics and the models. And they have references to each other. The models reference to the metrics. And we know there is some that are more used and some that are not even used in any model. And I just want to have a visual of what is what. I see. So let me, um, I'm going to share something really fast. Not on screen. I'll put it in chat. Oh, here. Do you want me to, I can unshare if you want to share your screen. Um, sure. Hold on. Yeah. Maybe pull it up here. Um, okay. So Elizabeth and I are actually doing a fairly large audit of the metrics we have, because not every metric, this is actually related to the conversation Don was going to put me on the spot for, but we're actually going through and taking a look at um, all of the metrics that we have on the web page. And um, we have like 85 or so on the web page. And what we're trying to do is kind of improve the quality of our metrics. Some are not real well written, some are not maintained real well. So we're trying to kind of focus our efforts on what are the most critical metrics. And so we're actually kind of doing, I think what you described. So it doesn't give a totality of, so like for example, types of contributions, it's in a metric model. We don't necessarily specify which one, you know, or how, if it occurs many times across different models. It's also mentioned in a practitioner guide that we have. And then we have a couple of badging programs around DEI. And so this metric is not part of either of the badging programs. And so I do have this 
Elizabeth and I have this sheet here, but it, it doesn't quite give the like the volume of usage that I think you were referring to. Yeah, I was going to just script something. I I was not going to go over them. So Okay. If you think it's useful, I do it. Otherwise I don't do it. <laughs> I think I think actually what, what might be useful, Damien, if I understand correctly what you're proposing would be um because it sounds like you're talking about doing it in sort of a graph model. So being able to see to be able to visualize how some of these things are connected to each other, how the metrics, certain metrics are connected to certain metrics models. Yep. <clears throat> uh, and if I do it, I, I was planning to just a Python script that scraps the thing and outputs where I should put it. Should I send it to a repository somewhere or? Yeah, probably. Um, so a couple thoughts. One, um, I really like this idea because one of the things that we are talking about right now is kind of the importance of metrics and I guess the associated models. And this would really, I think, help help us in that regard. Um, and so then if, if the work was going to be done, Elizabeth, do we have the metrics repo back up at this point? That's a great question. Um, I can check Thank on that you. while you all. I, I, <laughs> I thought maybe you'd know <laughs> off the top of your head. I I don't. Um, I, I, I will start working on it and we can see where we put it later. It's fine. Yeah, because it would be nice to maybe have a place in the metrics repository for for scripts that I don't know do various analysis about it. Um, if that if that doesn't make sense, we can probably find a place to put it within the data science working group. Uh, we have for other things sprinkled throughout uh, throughout the the data science working group. But yeah, you can start, yeah, like you said, you can start working on it and you can get the output and then we can figure out where to put it. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Let me just share the notes again. Okay, here we go. Uh, anything, anything else on that topic? I don't know, Matt, if there was anything else you wanted to. Um, no, I, I honestly think it'd be really helpful kind of helping in yeah. our conversation that's occurring yeah. around it. Okay, awesome. Um, we've had a few people join. I've been dropping the link in the chat. So you should all have the minutes and agenda, but we do have some, some extra time here on the agenda. So if anybody wants to add any um, agenda items, please, please go ahead feel free to do that. Um, the one thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about is the, the license changes, uh, basically relicensing and, and Bork's research project. So this is a project I've been working on out of the data science working group. But I know that this group, OSPOs, have been very interested in the topic of relicensing and forking. So I've I've done, I'm in the process of doing some additional research on this. I'm actually going to, pre I'm, I'm working on a paper for OFA, which is um, the Open Forum Europe event, which is interestingly, interestingly enough in Massachusetts at, at Harvard and not in Europe, but their academic uh, event is in November and um, they had a speaker drop out. And so they asked me to do this kind of at the last minute. So I'm scrambling to, to write a more academic focused paper on this in the next few weeks. Uh, so that's why well, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about this, this topic. But it is something that I presented at um, an Open UK event. Um, and the video, the video link is, is here in the minutes. And it was, it was a really, it was a really interesting session because uh, not just, you know, because I got to present, but before, before I presented. <laughs> largely because of that, but. <laughs> largely because I got to talk about stuff. Um, 
But no, it was really interesting because James James Governor from Red Monk talked about some of the financial analysis that uh, Rachel Stevens from Red Monk has done, along with just some of the interesting things that that they've been seeing uh, with their clients. So if you're not familiar with Red Monk, they're an open source uh, industry analyst firm, and they do really excellent, really excellent work. Um, and so it was really interesting to hear him talk about it from his perspective, and then I kind of you know, did a deep dive into the organizational affiliation data associated with a few a few case studies. And I, I can show you that in in just a minute. But one of the things that I found really interesting was he mentioned, so they they as an industry analyst firm, they have clients that they provide advice to on a regular basis. And they said that they had one client come to them who was thinking about relicensing. And after looking at what happened with the Valky fork of Redis, changed their mind and decided not to relicense because they were afraid that they would experience a, a fork that would, you know, potentially turn out to be successful or, you know, if nothing else, disruptive. Um, so obviously you couldn't tell us who that company was, but there's at least one example of somebody, uh, another vendor who has decided not to relicense based on some of what, what we're seeing uh, in the industry. So I find I found that that really interesting. So the the video with his talk and then my talk is is there. And I can I can share with you. Let me just um, Okay, can you see the presentation? Or do you see the notes? I see it. Presentation. Okay, presentation. Cool. Awesome. Um, so, so what I'm looking at for the forks and relicensing is really three case studies. So Elasticsearch and OpenSearch, uh, Redis and Valky, and then Terraform and OpenTofu. And the reason I'm doing this is because they're they're very kind of different different projects, and you'll you'll see that when we uh, when I kind of run through the data. But the you know the Elasticsearch relicensing uh, was interesting because the relicense had a much bigger impact on the users than on the contributors, and um, and you'll you'll see why this is when I when we look at the the data in in just a minute, but. Um, you know, this relicense happened in 2021, in February, two months later, they had an open search fork that was being driven out of Amazon AWS. Um, the interesting thing recently is that Elastic has added the AGPL. Um, so they are now under an open source license again. Um, I'm not sure it'll really make much difference and you'll see why when we look at the data. Um, but the other interesting thing is that OpenSearch has moved under the Linux Foundation as of um, September 16th. So I'd be really interested to see um, what that does to the, the contributor data. Um, so with, with Elastic, the, the takeaway here is that, so I'm comparing the year before Elasticsearch originally relicensed. So during that project, or sorry, during that period that was under Apache 2.0. Hmm. The second period, the project was under the SSPL and the Elastic license. So the second time period is during the period when Elasticsearch was not an open source project. So before they added the AGPL license. And you can see that it, it really made no difference. Um, Elastic employees are making over 95% of the additions and deletions to the code base. So I will be interested to run this again in six months and see if the adding the AGPL license makes a difference. But I'd be surprised if anything really changed from a contributor standpoint, because they didn't have a lot of contributors outside of Elastic um, anyways. Any questions on on that? We have use, uh, and that I know that's hard to quantify, but like the use of this before and after? Uh, no, I don't have I don't have usage data. I wish I did. That's like the hardest problem in open source. <laughs> <laughs> If know, anybody but... has usage data, that would be that would be amazing. Um, I was reaching. I was I, reaching. I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. I I don't think the relicense um, had a ton of, of well, it had. I mean, it had impact on the users because yeah. um, 
you know, I, well, I worked at VMware at the time and we, uh, we had to go through and look at how we were using it in every case and decide whether we could use it under one of the licenses that, that they proposed. And because uh, VMware was very much all in on cloud, which was the problematic part of the SSPL license, I think we ended up paying for it if I had, if I had to guess. It was individual business units actually doing it, but, but it, was, yeah. it was super disruptive from a usage perspective. Yeah, for, for a lot of the big tech companies, including the one that employs me. <laughs> I can guess that a lot of users migrated just because AWS migrated. Yeah. The yeah, exactly. of it is different now. Is I don't know, yeah. will be changed to or um we actually we migrated. Um if you so uh Grimoire Lab was based on Elasticsearch and Kibana and they migrated to open search and open search dashboards. Mm -hmm. So um yeah so i think i think the people that migrated were probably um in two camps like you said the people who were getting it from aws anyways so i think a lot of them ended up using open search because that's what aws was was offering um and then i think a lot of the people who really care about whether a solution is open source so this is the the bucket that we fit in as the chaos project was you know we we really wanted to support the the open source uh, open search because that was the the new open source fork of it. Um, and then if you look at the open search data, so I'm comparing the early days of the open search fork. So the first year uh, with the most recent year, but with an end date of when open search moved from Amazon into the Linux foundation. So, um, you know, I, I actually spent some time in the open search community during that first year of the fork. And a lot of the work was being done uh, within Amazon. So while the code was public um, and they said that it was an open project, uh, a lot of the discussions and decisions were really happening within within the company and it made it difficult for a lot of people to contribute. So it's, it's really not surprising that most of the contributions in that first year were coming from Amazon employees. Um, but what you can see is that's gradually <laughs> shifted. Um, and so this is the promising bit of, of open search. And this is what I'm hoping continues to accelerate under the Linux Foundation. Um, because they, you know, they did make some some improvements to their govern governance, which allowed more people to contribute. And I think that also facilitated the move into the Linux Foundation. Um, but it is worth noting that one individual who works at Ivan made most of the non-Amazon contributions in both mm -hmm. of those time periods. Um, so there were significant contributions from other people. Um, so this is kind of moving in the right direction. Um, but uh, but there is one individual that makes up quite quite a bit of that. And you can actually see this. Uh, the Yeah, the notebooks are linked at the bottom of each slide. And if you click on the notebook, you can see all the details. You can see all the people and exactly what I did to get to to get to this um, this summary. One active contributor still counts, though. Still counts. What? Oh Still. yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, it's and and that person is is super active in the open search project, and I think it's I think it's great. I you know I see this as a really promising um, evolution of the project. So okay. I've I've been really really kind of happy to see where open search has gone because I'll be honest, like in that first year, I I just sort of rage quit. I, I was just like, oh my God, this is not worth my time. They're, they're never going to be successful. They're never going to stop making all these decisions inside of the walls of Amazon. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be wrong. I, I, think, I, I think I am wrong. And I, I've been really happy with, um, with the progress that they've made. And I'm really interested to see, because uh, you know, I've been hoping they'd move it into the LF since the beginning. And so I'm really, really interested to see uh, where, this, where this goes. Thank you. For sure. Um, so the Redis Valky example is very different from what we just talked about. So in this case, there, there are a lot of contributors to Redis who weren't employed at Redis. Um, and a lot of this had to do with the fact that they, uh, the founder of the project, um, so it wasn't originally under a company, it was kind of under an individual and he moved to a couple different companies. Um, but he had always said that Redis would always be open source. Um, and, and so a lot of people kind of took that at its word, but, you know, at some point he kind of 
didn't wasn't involved in the company anymore and uh, they moved to a non-open source license. And these contributors who didn't work at Redis forked the project and started a new one called Valky. And the new project was started under the Linux Foundation. So from the start, it was under a neutral foundation rather than being started by a single company, the way Amazon AWS started OpenSearch. So, um, so even though it's a relatively new project and we don't have a ton of data yet, you can you can really see how it's how it's different. So if you look at starting with Redis, um, if you look at one year before the relicense, and then after the relicense. Um, and I've, I've actually extended this out to uh, six months. Um, I just haven't updated the slides. But you can see one year before the relicense, you know, most of the contributions were coming from uh, coming from Redis employees. Um, but, you know, there were still about a dozen people who were making significant contributions. And so in the six months after the relicense, all of those external contributors from companies like Amazon, Alibaba, Tencent, Huawei, Ericsson, who contributed over five commits in the year leading up to the relicense, they stopped contributing. Um, some of them made kind of one to three commits shortly after their relicense, which was, um, I think I think all of those were probably work in progress, um, PRs. And so the bit that looks odd is that the percentage of Reddit's employee contributions has gone down, <laughs> but this is not a result of more contrib contributions from outside of Redis. It has more to do with the fact that the raw, um, the contributions from employees and everyone else have gone way down. And so you can see this in the raw numbers where you would expect to see about half as many additions and deletions for the six month period. Um, instead it's way lower, which indicates that there are just fewer changes happening um, in Redis. And like many projects, Redis, of course, has a long tail of contributors who make only a small number of minor changes. And because there's so little activity in the repo right now, this long tail is making up for a higher percentage of changes than it was in the past. So I definitely need to talk to somebody from um, who's closer to the Redis project to better understand some of this. Some of this do you think that just has to do with like rug pull fatigue on this particular one with uh, the community just like really, really um, like the backlash was severe on this one from the community? Um, maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, it's certainly if you look at the the Redis employees, they're, you know, they they went from, you know, 189,000 commits. So you'd expect that to be, you know, half of that because it's six months. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, it's just way, it's way lower. Um, but this could this could mean any any number of things. It could be uh, kind of rug pull fatigue. It could be people being discouraged um, by the people leaving the community, um, and the fact that it's just a really difficult situation. It mm -hmm. could be that they are doing more of the development work in another branch that I'm not looking at because mm. I'm just looking at really commits to the basically whatever the default branch is. Uh -huh. um, so these are like the commits that end up in the default project. If they have big chunks of work that happen to be in development branches, that could explain that. Um, they could be doing some of this work in the private and planning to put it into the open source project. Um, so that could be um, a possibility. True, true. Um, Sophia, you had your you had your hand up. Yeah, no, I had the same thought as you. I just assumed they moved development work to another place. I mean, if it's not an open source project, then developing in that place there's less use for that. Like that's just kind of the purpose of it. So if that's not no longer their intention, I would assume development work would move to other places. Yeah. 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 That could very much, very much be the case. Okay. Um, yep. And then if you look at, <laughs> and then if you look at Valky, um, so this data is cut off when I ran it in August. Uh, oh, this is the one that I, I did go out six months, um, but I haven't, I haven't updated the slides. It doesn't, it doesn't change a lot. Um, but even with less than six months of data, you can get a pretty good feel for the organizations that are contributing to Valky. Um, you can see that Google employees have made the most additions and deletions, and most of those changes actually came from one of the, the two people. Uh, Amazon, on the other hand, has a whole bunch of people who've made, um, you know, more, more commits. And there are pretty significant contributions coming from Ericsson, Huawei, ByteDance, and a few others. And a lot of these individuals were contributing to Redis, 
and have moved to the Valky fork. So with Valky as a Linux Foundation project from the beginning, it's also not unusual <clears throat> to see contributions from a diverse set of organizations. Huh. What about um, former Redis contributors or maintainers? Like, do we uh, look at those? Yeah, I did. I did. And I think I, I think that there was one. One. Okay. Uh, I think there was one, um, but it wasn't, and it wasn't a lot of contributions. Hmm. I, I can, I can go back. If you actually look at the, if you look at the notebook on the, on the slide, I think you can, I think you can see that. I think it's in there somewhere. It. Oh, you got you linked to this stuff. No. Oh yeah, sorry, you can't click it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, I uh, I can find it. I can find it actually. <laughs> I see go, it. Now. Go to go to uh, go to Fast Wonder blog um, to the speaking page, and there's a link to the slides, the PDF version of the slides, which I will link from the. Um, or if you actually click on the. Um, click on the agenda, the license change and relicensing. We'll yeah, I'm in that repo. Video. That's I saw the link now. Yeah. I just like squinted my eyes to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah. Um, and so, so this one again is different. Um, so like with Falky, the new project was uh, started under the Linux Foundation. So from the beginning, it was under a neutral foundation rather than a company. Um, and, but in other ways, it's a lot like the open search fork because it was driven by users who hadn't contributed to Terraform. So they really had to start completely from scratch. So open search, they actually had really kind of two people who worked at Amazon who had made significant contributions to uh, Elasticsearch. So they had a bit of a head start, but, um, but not a lot, frankly. Um, but here there's there's nothing. So um, they they did have to start from scratch. There were no people who had contributed to uh, to Terraform who then moved to the open tofu project. Um, and you can kind of see why, right? Because uh, like the Elasticsearch example, HashiCorp employees made almost all of the contributions. So they were making, you know, over 90% of, of the contributions with only two people making more than um, five commits in the year leading up to the relicense. So this is before the relicense, they, they had almost no contributors and it's less than 1% of total additions and deletions. Um, that's not a typo, that is 0.04%. It's almost nothing. Um, and then after the relicense, um, there were there were two people who made commits. Uh, I think one of them might actually be a, a HashiCorp employee, but I haven't been able to, to track that down. Um, so, you know, again, after after the relicense, they're they're not surprisingly still being dominated by um, people from from HashiCorp. Um, Open Tofu has a pretty diverse set of contributions from a variety of companies, with Spacelift and ENVO making the most significant contributions um, and no contributions from HashiCorp employees after the fork. Um, but it's interesting to note that really none of these contributors contributed to Terraform. So like with the open search example, these were contributors <clears throat> who could learn the code base and start from scratch. Um, in contrast to Valky, where they had over a dozen contributors who moved to the fork. Um, and there are a few people who I don't have a company affiliation for. Um, and so, and, and there are a lot of people who've made small contributions, which is to be expected in a new and exciting uh, project like, like Open Tofu. But I was, I was presenting in a meetup with uh, James Humphreys from uh, Spacelift, and he was talking about how difficult it was to create this, this fork, um, because you know, within open source, I think we can be a little bit cavalier about this, right? Because we're like, well, if people don't like it, they can just fork it and take it in a new direction. Um, and, and so they did. And uh, he talked about how much work that was to, to actually fork a project and, you know, be adding new features and keeping up with security updates and figuring out how the code base works so that you can actually do all of these, all of these things. And it's, it's, it's hard. It's not, it's not an easy, it's not an easy task. So, um, so that that's been interesting, interesting to see. Okay, that was was it. That's all I that's all I had on the uh, um, 
forks and relicensing. I can go back to the back to the notes. That was good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, more coming soon. I'm working on a paper for this for for OFA that has uh, more of the details and more a little more of the analysis. It's still it's still mostly focused on the organizational uh, affiliation data, <clears throat> kind of the organizational dynamics, uh, because that's the bit that I've done so far. Uh, but eventually, the research will will pull in more of the chaos metrics and talk about more than just the organizations behind this, but talk about the actual actual project health metrics. So. So more of that, more of that coming soon. We have a couple of reminders for people. The chaos community survey is open. So we encourage people to participate and tell us about your experience within, within the project. Um, there are a couple of conferences coming up in March, which have open CFPs with deadlines in November. So if you're interested in going to one, but not both of these conferences, because you cannot get from LA to boss backstage without missing basically all of the good stuff at one of the conferences, you kind of gotta, you gotta pick one. Um, but the, the CFPs are open for those. Uh, they're both lovely events. I actually adore both of these events and I'm just absolutely gutted that they're at the same time again this year, uh, like they were two years ago. Um, I'll probably go to, I'll probably pick FOSS Backstage because that one's uh, more local for me since I'm in the UK. Um, but yeah, I adore both of these events. So I would encourage you to, to submit a talk if you're interested. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah, sorry. Okay. Um, I was, was going to say, I thought somebody else had something, but ChaosCon is official now for January 30th? Yes, absolutely. Um, so I don't know, Elizabeth, is the CFP open for that too? No, it isn't. Um, we will probably have registration open by tomorrow. That's our, that's the goal. Um, so I'll just drop a link in Slack when that's open. So like, I think $10, um, it's two days before FOSTEM. So for those people who also have events the day before FOSTEM, you can still attend those. You just need to come into Brussels a little early. Um, yeah, it's a full day. Uh, we're having a small social event at the rooftop bar afterwards. So it, you know, it's, it is the full day. Um, yeah, let me know if you do have questions before we release that. But um, again, look for that probably tomorrow. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, I hope to see hope to see a lot of you there. It should be it should be fun. Okay, we have just uh, we have a few more minutes. Um, I don't know if anybody else who's joined late has anything that they would like to to chat about. I don't but I want to say I really enjoyed the license change presentation. So thank you for doing that. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. It's been really fun. I just, I'm just, I don't know. I find this stuff super interesting. Uh, the organizational dynamics and open source is something that I've been really passionate about for a long time. It's actually, it's actually why I went back to school to get a PhD because I wanted to better understand how competing companies within the Linux kernel worked together uh, to produce the kernel, uh, which was the subject of my, my whole PhD. But the reason I the reason I wanted to do that, and then it ended up being about more than just organizational affiliation, because you know you have to you have to turn it into something that's worth a PhD. Um, but that that's really why it's this is this is a topic that I've been fascinated by since I worked at Intel in the I don't know 2010 a while ago a while ago <laughs> it's something I've been thinking about for for a long time, and I get super super nerdy about about this data. So it's um, yeah, and the the relicensing. You know, you know, forking is something that, you know, it's been in open source for forever, right? Since the very beginning, as soon as we had open source licenses, we started having uh, forks of projects. Um, but this whole, this whole relicensing thing introduces so many interesting dynamics. So yeah, so I find it, I find it really interesting. So I'm glad, I'm glad some of you found it interesting as well. And I will share the OFA paper once I, once I actually finish that. Yeah, it's like three really different um, examples of license changes that like, you know, have different dynamics, which is like, like, great. <laughs> uh, 
Um, I'm sure you get you you'll your paper will explain or help try to explain like what's going on in each one of the cases, but it's uh it's it's fascinating data set. Yeah. Something that, that is very interesting about the 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 free license is that it's not completely legal in every country. Like uh for example, if you contribute from Argentina, you cannot uh renounce to your rights about the code you contributed, even if you sign the CLA, because you are uh, in a position of losing. So you can sign whatever you want. They don't have the rights. So I guess there is more countries where it is like that. Yeah. But there is no no one questioning it yet. <laughs> but it's it's really interesting how they could kind of try to do it, but they don't cover the 220 different country legislation. They just assume, yeah. oh yeah, it's the US. We can do this. And it's not the US. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. And and you know, the the problem is, right? Like if, if I'm sitting in Argentina and I've contributed to Elastic and then they relicense, it would be sort of on me to bring bring a you know, a lawsuit or something against these big companies. And that's that's a really it's a really daunting prospect, you know, but um but it does happen. Like this happened with uh with the Linux kernel actually about oh gosh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago where uh Christoph Helbig um brought a suit against uh, VMware, uh, this is before I worked there, um, for uh, violating the GPL for code that he had written in the kernel. And mm. he, brought, he brought this lawsuit and he worked with the Software Freedom Conservancy um, yeah. to, to bring this lawsuit in the German courts. Uh, and ultimately it, it wasn't successful, um, but uh, but it was it was really interesting to see this sort of David and Goliath situation where you had one individual kernel developer who was like, I'm just I'm not going to I'm not going to take this um, going up against one of the largest software companies in the world. That's another difference. If you do copyright claiming in. Everyone assumes that this is like in the States where you have to be the owner of the copyright, but in some countries you don't have to. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be, yeah, it's it's really it's really interesting um, because open source in Argentina it might be considered public good, so anyone can claim about it. Yeah, huh, interesting. Oh, well, on yeah. that we had a Visio case going on in in states but, basically. Yeah, so we'll say say more about that one. Well, the the case that the, not the copyright owner has sued Visio. It was the software conservative. Oh, oh yeah. Ever, ever, like you know, sued sued them because they bought the TV. Yeah, the soft, software conservancy. Um, helps yeah, 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 yeah. Bring bring license that they, they are the ones that helped the. Uh, sorry, it wasn't Software Freedom Law Center. It was the uh, software. Software Conservancy? Why am I mangling the name? Um, anyways, yeah, they they do help people bring some of these yeah. some of these suits. But yeah, the the whole idea was that they are not the copyright owner, but they are you know suing the the Visio because they are violating the GPL. But okay, who that's... knows? You know, it might take you know like another five years for that to get settled or yeah. get any anything, but. It's going on, I think, in California. It is the Software Freedom Conservancy. I did have that right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Uh, anything else? OK, well, thanks, everybody. I thought these were really, really interesting discussions. Um, so, so this was, yeah, this was a really interesting, really interesting meeting. So thanks everybody for coming. And thank you, Don, for presenting. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you, Don. Um, and I hope everyone has a good day, good evening, depending on your depending on your time zone. So it was great to see everybody. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Bye everybody. Thank you. Bye bye.